Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the scriptures. Thank you because you've given us the Holy Spirit who directs us into all truth. As we're here this night, we pray that you'll speak the truth to our hearts in Jesus' name. We're asking that you give us wisdom from your word in Jesus' name. And we're praying that as you teach us, we'll be successful and victorious in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. Guide us step by step as we study the word. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're studying Acts chapter 10 from verse 19 to verse 33. We studied verses 1 to 20 last week. So we're taking on two verses of scripture which we read last week, linking it up with the passage of study today so we can get the flow of thought that were given in the scriptures. Whenever we come on Monday like this, we study the Bible. We go from one part of the Bible to the other, digging out blessed information and scriptural truth that will make us victorious in the Christian work and in the Christian world. As also to make us victorious in every area of our lives. There's so much in scripture that we, if we follow our guide, if we follow the Holy Ghost, as he leads us through the scriptures, will not ruin our lives. And just to go on, so to say, in the wings of devotion, and feel that maybe praying and Holy Spirit and revelations alone will carry us through without a deep study of the word and application of the word is to ruin our lives, our Christian lives, as well as even our normal life. Now, Pentecostal churches talk about revelations, gifts of the Spirit, visions, and many things are related to things of the Spirit. And we do too, because we take the whole Bible. But then, as you study in the scriptures, you begin to see how to get understanding in the things of the Spirit. And the things we're studying today, I do not want you to miss out, because they're very, very important for those who have spiritual eyesight to see, and uh, they want to follow the Lord very, very closely. You need to understand what we're studying today. As we read in chapter 10, the beginning verses last week, Cornelius saw a vision. Peter also saw a vision. The vision related to the same thing. The gospel, the full gospel was to be preached to the Gentile household. And God was going to use Peter to get the work done. That was the essence of the vision or the revelation that God showed to Cornelius. It was also the essence of the revelation that God showed to Peter. But then Cornelius got his vision and the revelation through an angel. But Peter got his own revelation of vision through a trance. He did not see an angel. That shows us that when God gives you or imparts knowledge unto you in a supernatural way, he doesn't always do it in the same way. For Cornelius, he may send an angel to pass across the message. For Peter, he may send the trance of sheet falling down from heaven, and then he may hear a voice, arise, kill, and eat. But all the same, whichever the channel God will use, and whichever the avenue God may choose to pass the message across, if it is coming from him, it's a vision all the same, and it's an heavenly vision. And then we see that as the angel talked with Cornelius and gave him the knowledge that Cornelius needed to know, to send men to Joppa so that they will contact Simon Peter and the house was described the person he was staying with was described as the angel said that he stopped and went away 
the angel did not allow a conversation between Cornelius and himself. The ministry of angels is very, very clear in the Bible. But then those angels, whenever they are sent on mission, they have the responsibility or the commission they were to carry out and they will not allow themselves to be questioned, interrogated, interviewed by speculative men or women who will not want to have the knowledge of the scriptures but will want secret knowledge from the angels. And uh, they never enter into covenant with man saying now you know Cornelius saying now angel you've been so nice and you've spoken to me well why not just say uh, let's get into a, into a covenant so that whenever I need information from heaven whenever I need to know more even after Peter has come and gone I can always call upon you and you will always come those angels never get into any covenant with human beings if any angel ever gets into covenant with a human being, it's a fallen angel. Not sent from heaven. Not sent to do the will of our Father God in heaven. It's a fallen angel that wants to bring that man into a covenant relationship with evil spirits and with the devil. So you understand that when you are talking about spiritual things, God can show you a revelation. God can even send an angel to bring an information to you but. That angel, if he's been sent from the Father God in heaven, he'll not go beyond what the Father had told him to do. And you cannot get into a relationship with uh, that angel because the Holy Ghost is to lead you and to lead me into all truth. Not Gabriel, not Michael, not an angel. And whenever an angel gets involved, gets involved with just a short time. And he reveals just a small bit of the knowledge. And then he will point you to a man or a woman full of the Holy Ghost who will lead you to all truth. Now, as we read about Cornelius, now the angel said, you send men to Joppa. As to how many men he was to send, the angel did not say. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, look at verse 5. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. How many people am I going to send? There will be no answer. You know what? There is natural knowledge. There is scriptural knowledge. There is spiritual knowledge. It is your responsibility to find out natural knowledge by yourself. If the road is dangerous, and you know it is dangerous for only one man to go from Caesarea to Joppa, you understand then that uh, a company of people will be necessary. And therefore you will use natural knowledge. A revelation has come that is spiritual knowledge. Send men to Joppa. How many men am I going to spend? You, you use your natural knowledge on that one. As well as scriptural knowledge. You know that this is not the first time that um, somebody will be sent from one place to the other. Yeah, as you read in the Bible, you'll find there were times that uh, people have been sent on errands like that. Moses sent people from the wilderness to Canaan. He didn't only send one person. And Joshua sent people when they were settling at the borders of Canaan and sent them to go and spy out Jericho. He sent two people. And Jesus Christ, when he was going to send people, he sent them two by two. And so you have natural knowledge. Is the road dangerous? Then you send more than one man. And you know that the Bible says two are better than one. Because if one falls, then the other will lift him up. And Cornelius knew. He understood. He wasn't a child or a little boy. And as a person that was growing in life, he had natural knowledge and he also had scriptural knowledge, some bit of it. And so he sent two of his servants and then he put a man of authority to follow after them. He sent a soldier also with them, making three. And so then we understand, you know, there are Pentecostal people, charismatic people. And they say, yes, all we do is by revelation. And if the Lord tells them to go and get married, and they saw that by revelation, you know they are waiting for the date by revelation? They don't understand that if God has given you a spiritual knowledge, and has given you a go-ahead to go and get married, 
as to going to registry, Angel will not come and tell you that there are counselors here to tell you that. As to fixing the date, Angel will not tell you that. As to whether the wedding will be at 10 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Angel will not tell you that. But you know, there are people who carry this thing too far. And he said, Angel spoke to me when I was to start, and therefore Angel will talk to me now what I am to do. You may wait until you become 70 years of old, and the angel will never come again. And you say, Angel, come back, come back. I'm waiting for you to come and give me the date of wedding. And that angel will say, that man is so dumb. He doesn't understand the things of the Lord. And you know, the same thing with pastors in churches. Now maybe the Lord has called them in a supernatural way, by a revelation, by a vision. And the Lord has told them that they will carry out a ministry. And now they, they are waiting, they say, oh yes, I saw a vision, I saw a revelation. As to what they are to do now, after that, they just abandon natural knowledge and scriptural knowledge. And they feel that every step of the way, every step of the way, either an angel will come or another revelation will come. But you know, the Lord wants us to use all we have at our disposal. Spiritual knowledge is wonderful when, they come, when it comes. But then, natural knowledge is necessary. Scriptural knowledge, which we have gathered all over these years, we've been studying the Bible, it's also very, very important. And so, Cornelius applied the natural knowledge and the scriptural knowledge in line with the spiritual knowledge the Lord had just given him. And he sent three men. And these three men, they went to Joppa to go and find out Simon Peter. Now, on the side of Simon Peter, Simon Peter had seen a vision as well. And it was a different type of vision. The Lord was breaking down a barrier. The Lord was breaking down a wall of partition because there was um, no relationship between the Gentiles and the Jews. There was so much hatred between them. Uh, according to theologians and uh, writers of ancient history of the Jews, at the time of the Roman Empire, they tell us this, that it was common saying within the Jews that they would say the Gentiles were made as fools for the flame of hell. They didn't feel there was any hope for the Gentiles. All those Jews, they just believed that uh, those uh, Gentiles were to perish. But you know, the Gentiles were in power they, because the Roman people were Gentiles. And the Roman people were saying, on the other hand, that the Jews were made to be slaves of the Gentiles. They were just to rule over them. And you can tell, if they had those uh, maxims or those proverbs uh, to tease one another, they really hated one another. And uh, there was a great enmity between them. But then God gave uh, Peter this vision. And he said, you don't call anyone anything common or unclean that I have cleansed and accepted. And we're told in verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now let's wait there. The Lord uh, spoke to Peter and he said, I have sent them. Go with them. What's he going to do? Is he going to go alone? The Spirit didn't say. Is he going to go with other people? The Spirit didn't tell him. You see, when you read your Bible, when you study the Bible, and uh, you want to be wise unto salvation, you want to be wise unto whatever ministry the Lord has given you, you must um, dig deep into the Word of God. Now Peter, an apostle, as the Spirit has spoken to him again, you know, he couldn't say, well, uh, I want more knowledge. What the Spirit has shown me, that's all right, but I want more. How should I go? Should I go myself alone or should I go with other people and then there could be silence? Because Peter, the Holy Ghost knows that you have natural knowledge as well as scriptural knowledge. And uh, you must remember all that you have been taught from the Old Testament to the New Testament times to the time of Jesus. You must apply all the knowledge you have 
to be able to follow on as to what the Lord is telling you. Uh, you know, it helped him so very much later when he came back. If he had gone alone, there will be some difficulties he would have had that he would not be able to resolve. He took six men with him. And he himself became number seven. Peter, why are you doing that? Well, Peter will remind you, will tell you, I don't know exactly, but I just feel that that number seven is a good number, a perfect number. And you will remember when I was asking the Lord uh, uh, Jesus Christ, when I said, now when people, when they offend us, how many times do we forgive? Until seven times. That number seven has just been in my heart all the time, and I just knew that was a good, perfect number. And if I chose six, and I go along with them, will be seven. And when we come back, the testimony we have in our mouth will not be only two or three, but seven people will be able to say, this is what happened there. You see, there is a knowledge we already have. And when the Holy Ghost comes to lead us and He comes to speak to us, then we also apply the natural and the scriptural knowledge we already have. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 and in verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Now again, he did not wait for the Holy Ghost to tell him that, to tell him that, well, you must go with two people, three people, or six people. You know, those who will feel guilty, if you called, if uh, the Holy Ghost spoke to them, and the Holy Ghost has said, go. And if they go with six other people, all along the way, they'll be feeling guilty. They'll be saying, well, I don't know whether I'm in the will of God or not. Because the Holy Ghost only spoke to me. And uh, he didn't tell me to take uh, all these six people. And I've been waiting for confirmation. I've been waiting for a dream, another revelation, another vision. I don't know whether it is right or not to take all these six people. Natural knowledge will tell you whether it's right or not. Scriptural knowledge, the experience you gather all over these years in the Bible, will show you whether it is right or not. This is how to follow the Lord. He gives you the vision, He tells you what to do, and then all the knowledge you've gathered from the Bible you are, that you have acquired, you join everything together and you follow the Lord. But that's not all. These six men did not have a separate revelation. Only Peter had the vision. And he called on the six men and he said, let's go. And they went. I know some Christians, even in church, if the Lord has shown a revelation or a vision to the minister who is a pastor or the general's superintendent, and he has called on them and has said, um, now you follow me, let's go and do this. You know, they'll be asking questions. Oh, they say, because I want to follow the Lord. I want to follow the Lord. You do? Then follow the pastor. Well, pastor, did God give you my name? God didn't give the names of these six people to Peter. There's the natural knowledge and the scriptural knowledge. Everything together with the revelation knowledge will make the full knowledge. And so we need to understand as the Lord is leading so that we'll be able to follow the Lord and in obedience to the Lord. We'll talk about the faithful messengers, the first meeting, and the fervent members. Now, as the Lord had spoken to both Cornelius and Peter, they were faithful. And as the Lord, through Cornelius, called these other three men and said, this is what to do, they were faithful. And as the Lord called on the six men to follow after Peter and they get the work done immediately, they were faithful. That is what the Lord is requiring from us. Let's see from Acts chapter 10 verse 19 again. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men, which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And he said, 
Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. Then he called them in and he lodged them because it was already late by the time they arrived. And the Holy Ghost did not say, now accommodate them. The Bible already said that to show hospitality. And so what the Bible had already said, Peter did not need to wait for another revelation again. He just called them in and he accommodated them. The Holy Ghost did not say, don't go tonight. Wait until tomorrow. Common sense told them that. They knew it was late already. And they knew they were going to walk in the road. And if they were going to do that in the night, it would be dangerous. Therefore, they will wait until tomorrow. You see, it's wonderful to study the Bible. Because after you have become saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you have got the gifts of the Holy Ghost, you don't throw away your common sense. You know, there are Pentecostal people who do that. They throw away their common sense. They will not even use ordinary common sense. Now they are just on the wings of an eagle. They are flying and they are ready for a crash. But you know, they waited until the following morning. And we're told on the morrow, Peter went away with them. And certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now whenever the Lord speaks to us, he wants us to be faithful. To faithfully carry out what the Lord is teaching us and what the Lord is telling us. Luke chapter 14, verse 22. And his servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. We should do things as the Lord has commanded. And if there is still time, and there is still room, and there are still some things left undone. We we'll report back and then we, we search the scriptures. We we'll listen to him and we we'll see what further things we must do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithfulness is so very important. Proverbs chapter 25 and in verse 13. Proverbs 25 verse 13. As cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that sent him. For he refreshes the soul of his master. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, our Master, will be refreshed, will be happy, will be joyful when we are faithfully carrying out the commission that he has given to us. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast them of you into prison, that he may be tried. And he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. We're required to be faithful. There may be persecution, there may be trial, there may be misunderstanding from people who are not spiritual, who do not understand spiritual things, but then we're supposed to be faithful. You know, Peter doing this exposed himself to difficulties, questioning, contention from fellow believers. But then even though the difficulties were there, the misunderstanding could be there, the prejudice between the Jews and the Gentiles were there. Now, Peter knew this was the call of the Lord, the commission of the Lord. And he was going to obey and he was going to be faithful whether people understood or not and the Lord wants us to be faithful even though others may misunderstand 
our call, our commission, what the Lord is telling us to do. There may be people, uh, maybe who have the same office as we are, who have the same uh, Christian commitment and work as we have in other churches. And yet, even though they misunderstand, and even though they might uh, contend against us, we know what the Lord has told us. We know what he has sent us to do, and it must be done. The Lord requires faithfulness, faithfulness. And whatever the Lord is showing you to do, in line with his own word, because God never contradicts his word. Whatever the Lord is showing you to do according to his word, you must obey in faithfulness. Look at uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 28. And he said unto them, that's Peter talking, Ye know how that it is unlawful, it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me. I don't know what he has showed other people, he has showed me. I don't know what, the, what other people know or what they are ignorant of, he has shown me that I shall not call any man common or unclean. Peter knew that all the other Jews, even those who have become members and part of the church in Jerusalem, he knew that when they heard, they were going to call him for questioning, contention. But he said, I must act on the basis of what he has showed me. I must be faithful. Even though people may persecute, they may oppose, they may misunderstand, I am called to faithfulness. And he said in verse 29, Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore what, for what intent ye have sent for me. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 11, verse 2. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him saying thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst each with them he got into trouble you know you can get into trouble obeying god because there are people around you who are blind to spiritual things who have not seen the vision of the glory of god that you have seen who have not heard the voice of the lord that you have heard who are still in their tradition they are born again, but they are bound with the clothes of tradition, the thoughts of tradition, and they are bound with the, the preconceived ideas, tradition. But God has spoken to you. God has changed your life. God has brightened your vision. And God has told you, those people who are created by God, you go after them and reach after them and win them to the Lord. Then others may misunderstand. If you wait until everybody else in the whole world will understand you, you will never do anything for God. Be faithful. Now, these were faithful messengers. Now, let's look at the first meeting between Cornelius and uh, Peter a wonderful meeting now you know on one day Cornelius was just uh, praying unto the Lord and as he was praying unto the Lord he saw this vision come to verse 3 and he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day that's about three o'clock in the afternoon an angel of God coming in to him saying unto him Cornelius and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose name is um, Peter. Now, that day, he couldn't send it. People were told, verse 9, On the morrow, as they went on their journey, and then they got there, and again, we're told by the time they got there, it was late. And we're told again that uh, on the morrow, they left for uh, Joppa. That's in verse 23. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa. And uh, they got there. That is, they got to uh, Cornelius the, the following day verse 24 
and the morrow after they had entered into Caesarea. Already now you are uh, you are thinking of what this already. Now think of this man. This for illustration to make you understand. Pay attention. Suppose it was Friday when Cornelius was praying. On the morrow will be Saturday. They got to Joppa. But they stayed there that Saturday. On the morrow, that will be Sunday. They left Joppa and they were coming now to Caesarea. On the morrow, they got there and now Peter and Cornelius met. That will be Monday. Now, if you are talking about uh, Friday, when you are now on Monday, you will say four days ago. Friday one. Saturday 2, Sunday 3, Monday will be 4. And so when um, Peter got there and he, he wanted to know now Cornelius, here am I, what have you called me for? And then he had to tell the story. Four days ago, while I was fasting about this hour, then he began to re relate what really happened. Let's see the first meeting in, uh, from verse now 24. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Stop there. Don't pass it by. There's something there. The angel didn't tell him that. The angel just said, your prayers are answered. Then arms have come up as a memorial before God. Send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon Etana, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee. It's just for you. He will tell you what thou oughtest to do. He will tell you. But then the angel had gone to heaven, back. And the men, he said, they had gone back to Peter. Uh, sorry, they had gone to Peter to go and fetch him out and bring him. And while he was there, don't be idle. Don't just say, well, I'm waiting for Peter. I'm waiting for the message. You know what he began to do? He began to share his testimony with his friends. And he began to tell them that uh, a messenger of God is coming from Joppa. He's going to tell me the way of the Lord. He's going to tell me more than I know now. Now, as you walk in the light you have, God will give you further light. And before Peter came, he had collected together all his kinsmen. He was going to them one by one. All those uh, two days in between, in between the first day and the fourth day, the second and the third days, he was going about talking to them one by one. Let's gather together. He'll be coming. He had calculated when Peter will come. And also his near friends. The word near in Greek actually means uh, necessary friends. Soldiers who are disciplined don't have unnecessary friends. Necessary, near. People that, you know, deliberately he just knew that they must be friends. And then what he needed, he knew that the other the friends, they needed as well. He gathered them together. Now, you, you, when the Lord has given you the gospel, whether he calls you an evangelist or not, whether he calls you a soul winner or not, you gather the other people around you don't need an angel to come and tell you that if that gospel message that peter is coming to preach is good enough for you it is good also for your kinsmen and for your near friends and you know there are people who will never do anything never do anything until an angel will tell them from heaven until a pastor will put them in that position until you put them in the register, you call them a worker. Until you tell them step by step, you must do this, you, you spoon-feed them. But Cornelius did not need to be spoon-fed. He just knew it would be right to gather these people together. That brings me again back to natural knowledge, scriptural knowledge, and spiritual knowledge. All must be working together. And now you know, there are people who have a... a some gifts of the spirit and because they do not apply everything they ought to apply and they just re depend only on revelations and visions and dreams that's why they ruin their ministries and they become fanatical and they become people like people that have no mind no knowledge no brain no intelligence and they do foolish things 
and they will say, well, that's the way the Holy Ghost directed me. The Holy Ghost will never direct you against the scriptural knowledge and against natural knowledge. The Holy Ghost will make you to understand that everything must work together and you must do what you ought to do as the Lord is leading and directing. And so he collected all these people together. And in verse 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Ah, you say that's idolatry. Well, it was bad. You know what? Cornelius was praying in his house. He saw an angel, an holy angel. That's what the Bible says in verse 22. And he said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for you into his house and to hear words of thee. Now, Cornelius saw an holy angel. And that holy angel named and recommended Peter. And uh, Cornelius did not know who this Peter was. But he knew that if uh, this man was recommended by an angel, this man must be greater than angel. Cornelius did not worship the angel. Didn't you see that? But because the angel recommended Peter and called his name and, uh, and mentioned where he was living, Cornelius started thinking, this man that is coming, it's not just a Jew, it's not just a Gentile, it's a messenger of God in heaven and they have all his record, all his movement in heaven. And it is from heaven they just determine his timetable and schedule of his life. This man must be great, greater than an holy angel. That's what the Gentile was thinking. And when the Peter arrived, he just fell down and he said, I will do anything because an angel told me your name. Well, it was error, but God didn't punish him for the error. If you do that, God may punish you because you know better. Are you following me? Because he was totally ignorant. He fell down and he worshipped. But thank God for Peter. Thank God for Peter. Thank God he wasn't a pope. That he would build a statue somewhere and fall to kiss his feet. You know, that's what some people do. Peter has gone, but he put a statue somewhere and he fall down and kiss his feet. But you know, if Peter were to be alive, he'll tell you, no, I am not. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And he talked with him and went in and found many, not just a few many that were come together. And uh, he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful sin for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one that uh, of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gain saying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? Now he said, this is a special meeting. You're all Gentiles. Gentiles hate the Jews. This is not something common. This is not something lawful. But here I come. And we Jews too, for a long time, we have had prejudice against uh, you Gentiles. But as we're coming, don't let us allow prejudice to hinder us. Because God has shown me, I don't know what he has shown you, but he has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And therefore, I don't regard any of you common. I don't regard any of you unclean. I just regard you as people that want to love the Lord and want to have more light of the gospel truth. And I know from what uh, Cornelius has done already, the respect that has given me, which is even too much which he should not have given to me. I know there is no barrier in his heart as well. And I know that in your own heart too, there is no barrier because you're all waiting for me. Now, for what intent have you sent for me? The barrier was broken down. The wall of partition was taken away. The bitterness and prejudice of so many years between the Jews and the Gentiles right there was taken away. And now they can share the gospel truth together. And that brings us to the fervent members. Oh, these were a congregation, a special congregation. 
And if every congregation will be like this, will enter into the baptism of the Holy Spirit in no time. You know, people wonder. Uh, they say, well, uh, how about uh, these people? As soon as Peter began to talk, he opened his mouth and the Holy Ghost fell upon them. Now, why doesn't the Holy Ghost fall like that today upon people? Think about it yourself. These people had been waiting. No usher. Nobody to say, keep quiet. They were looking in one direction outside the window. They were looking for that man, Peter. They were so eager. And Cornelius will sit down, then he will stand up and look outside. Then he will sit down again. He was so eager, he was so expectant. And he wanted this man of God to come and tell whatever he will want to tell them. And they were all eager like that. And they forgot every other thing. They forgot other friends outside. They forgot food. They forgot everything. Everything secular, everything natural. And um, when Peter came, they, were, they just opened up. And as he was talking, they were too ready. The Holy Ghost came upon them. And you know, if our church is like that every time, whenever you are coming, it's not that you come to a church to do business, distributing business cards, right, as the preaching is going on. You know, if you are not doing that, and uh, you are not worried about any other thing, you just focus your attention on the preacher, on the messenger that is bringing the word of truth, and you're expectant. And you say, whatever the Lord has for today, let him give that thing to me. And your heart is emptied of all secular preoccupations. And your heart is empty of all um, selfish ambitions. And you just say, just the Lord do I want. Just the Lord do I want. And the message of the Lord I want. I want to eat up everything. Give it to me. You know, if we're all like that, we'll be more spiritual like, than we are now. That's how they were. They were fervent. They were ready. They were expectant. And in verse 30, Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is answered, is a her, and thine arms are added in, in remembrance in the sight of God. You know, he said, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Now, he knew he was an angel because he was the person that told the three messengers he sent to Joppa that an holy angel appeared unto him. But when the angel appeared, listen now, he appeared like a man in bright clothing. But then he was talking to an apostle who had seen Jesus Christ before, who had seen angels before, and as Cornelius was relating his testimony before this apostle and also before uh, this man recommended by an angel his language must be moderate because he wouldn't want Peter to stop him and say no no that is wrong because this man that has just come in he has never known before obviously in his own heart uh, this man greater than the angel he saw and he saw him as he stood before him and he was a man so he said uh, four days ago as i was praying a man appeared to me of course i've been calling him angel holy angel but i saw him as a man because you are a man of god i must tell you everything as it was but uh, please he was in bright clothing cornelius don't have any fear go ahead Peter is not going to condemn you for whatever you say. You want to call him angel, call him angel. You want to call him man, call him man. But you see, you know what is happening in his side. He had never met this Peter before. And, you know, he was just relating the things that happened. And in verse, um, in verse 33, 32, Send therefore, he told me, to Joppa, and call he the Simon, whose son name is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon Etana by the seaside. Who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee. And thou hast well done that thou art come. But listen to this. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded of thee, of God? All things. Don't hide anything. 
Don't be afraid we will not do it. Whether it is repentance or restitution, say it. Whether it is separation from the world or holiness unto the Lord, say it. Whatever it is, it may be contrary to the notions of the Gentiles, say it. Whatever the Lord has commanded you, we are ready here. All of us here, we will not be here if we are not ready for the whole counsel of God. Therefore, are we all here present before God? Our hearts are ready. Our hearts, we have examined our hearts. All the time we are waiting for you, we examined our hearts. Is there anything the Lord will want to tell us which we are not ready for? We examined our hearts. Is there anything the Lord will want to correct in our lives which we are not ready for? We examined our hearts. Is there anything the Lord will want to command us to do which will be too lazy or too weak or, or too um, incorrigible to be able to rise up and do it? We have examined our hearts and we have found out we are ready for anything. We are ready for anything. Therefore, don't hide anything from us. Tell us all things that are commanded thee of God. You know, that's exactly what the Lord expects from us today. That whenever we come before him, we will not come with um, a worldly fear. A worldly fear that in the sense that, well, and we don't know what the Lord is going to say today. Maybe he's going to take that thing away from me. Maybe he's going to call me to deeper consecration. Maybe he's going to tell me uh, to make restitution on one area. Maybe he's going to tell me to repent of a particular habit. Whatever it is, if we're ready, and we will join that same um, congregation in the household of Cornelius and say, we're all present here before God to hear all things that are commanded by God. Do you know that before long, the Holy Ghost will be so much poured upon us that uh, everybody will know we have had, we have been in the presence of God. And you know, that is the attitude that brings us blessing every time we come before the Lord. Hearts open with great expectation, saying, I am ready. If the Lord wants to talk on healing, I'm ready for that. But if it's not healing, if it's holiness, I'm ready for it. If the Lord is going to talk about blessing, I am ready. But if the Lord is going to talk about uh, discipline, uh, of a real child of God to live a disciplined life I'm ready as well and you know when we are like that the blessings of God will flow upon our lives and tonight I'm calling you to give yourself to the Lord in that way and say God now I really want to seriously worship you and whatever you want to tell me now I am ready and whenever I come to church on Sunday on Thursday on on, on Monday, anytime, whatever you want to tell me, I will be ready every time. And the blessings of God will so overflow in your life, there will be not enough room to take the blessings of God. Rise up and let us pray. How is your heart before God? From all that you have learned today, have you behaved in a foolish way before? Have you acted as if you are altar spiritual? And you don't even use the scriptural knowledge you had in the Bible before? Be balanced, be balanced. Still necessary to study the Bible, even after you have got the Holy Ghost baptism and the gifts of the Spirit as well, and to direct your life on the study of the Word. And then you open up to God every time that will be done. I'll carry out your word. Whatever it is, I am ready to hear, to listen, and to obey to all things that are commanded of God. 